morning and welcome to Business Morning. I'm Chimeze Obi Iwago. Thank you for joining us. Well, ahead of the official launch on October 1, the Central Bank of Nigeria has launched a website for the operations of eNaira, the country's first digital currency. According to the information on the eNaira website, the digital currency will ensure easier financial transactions for users and allow peer-to-peer payments through a linked bank account or card. Also, the eNaira will facilitate cash distribution in the government's social welfare programs. The CBN Governor Godwin Emefile is optimistic that the eNaira, the first in Africa, will bring about increased cross-border trade, accelerate financial inclusion, and lead to cheaper and faster remittance flow. And September 27 was marked as World Tourism Day with a theme, Tourism for Inclusive Growth. Côte d'Ivoire hosted this year's celebration showcasing the potentials of tourism to create jobs for all and bring communities together. Our business correspondent, Ine John Nakwa, reports from Côte d'Ivoire. Abidjan, the major urban center and economic capital of Côte d'Ivoire, home to about 4.7 million people. This accounts for 20% of the country's total population. These features and its skyscrapers have perhaps made it more popular than the country's capital, Yamasukro. The drums and dance of the people of Côte d'Ivoire is another attraction as the city hosts representatives of 125 countries at the 2021 World Tourism Day celebration. Our sector can help to bridge gaps of opportunity in many parts of the world. Across Africa, we see countless cases of young people being the first in their families to get an education or a job, thanks to tourism. We also see rural communities embracing tourism to generate opportunities and future of the other people. This is what tourism for inclusive growth means. After the opening speeches, exhibition stands receive attention. The focus of discussion here is how can tourism live up to its inclusive growth opportunity and the experts agree that making domestic tourism more attractive is a solution. Um, you know, Abidjan is, is opening, you know, the opportunity for me, even though nobody here asked me, is I'm letting Kenyans and East Africans and fellow people who follow and interact with me to, to come along for the ride. It's usually important to prove that you can do it. Because a lot of the time, we feel that government has got all the money. And therefore, when we go to government with any proposal, the government is going to give us money. It doesn't work like that. What remains is action plan on improving domestic tourism, not just on the part of the government, but also by Africans. In John Mekwa, Channel Television News. And uh, the first ever UN Food System Summit was held last week in New York as part of the high-level meetings of the 76th session of the United Nations General Assembly. The summit set the stage for global food systems transformation to achieve the Sustainable Development Goals by 2030. It saw nearly 300 commitments from hundreds of thousands of people from around the world and across all constituencies to accelerate action and to transform food Food systems. President Mohamed Buhari restated his administration's commitment to national food security by pledging to invest in food security and nutrition knowledge dissemination, skills development and information management systems to enhance agricultural productivity for national food security. So how can this come to reality? I'm being joined by the chairman, Best Foods Global, Emmanuel Ijewiri. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Ijewiri, for joining me. Thank on the you very program. much. Glad to have you. I hope you, you didn't have issues coming in here. No, no, no. The traffic was quite good. Great. Now, this was the first uh, ever food system summit organized by the United Nations. Yeah. What for you is the significance of this summit? I think it's symbolic and um, I, to be commended, especially after the pandemic. The pandemic had a devastating effect on food value chain throughout the world. Nigeria was, in fact, more negatively impacted because while we were fighting the pandemic, we were fighting bandits, we were fighting the herders, we were fighting Boko Haram. All these things created problems for our farmers. And the value, the value chain was very badly disrupted, not to mention 
the ever-present bad roads we have and also. So it was a very good thing. Nigeria stands or stood to benefit a lot from it. Now, coming at a time like this, uh, talking about food system, how would you describe uh, the state of food system in Nigeria and, of course, Africa as a whole? Um, when you talk about Africa, it has to be understood first. Nigeria is a different kettle of fish compared to the rest of Africa. We have a huge population we, that is, to a large extent, very poor. We also have a vast country. We have a very low level of education. And so when you look at Nigeria as a whole, you discover that it's a country that has a peculiar problem separate from Africa. Other African countries are smaller, and many of them have become a lot more efficient. And the question we will ask yourself is, if you have two fathers, one of them has a family of 15 children, the other has a family of two children, they don't have the same problems. So Nigeria has a large, large number of mouths to feed, having a large number of people to look after. So actually, Nigeria stands out uh, because of other ailments we have, that pre-existing conditions. Mm. That, uh, so Nigeria is a, has a lot of challenge and must now revolutionize to be able to achieve those goals. Right. You know, most times when we talk about food security, agriculture, a lot of people think more about crop production, I mean, going to the farm. Mm. But then there's this aspect of the health implication, talking about the nutritional value of the kind of food we eat, which, of course, is also part of the conversation mm. here at the summit. Coming the backdrop of this um, global pandemic where health has become paramount and it exposes, you know, the weak health system that some of the countries particularly in Africa, mm -hmm. like Nigeria, you know, has. Now, what can be done to improve uh, nutritional uh, quality among citizens in Nigeria? Before we deal with that, first, I segment Nigeria again into two groups. Mm. Those who live in the villages, they have enough quantity of food to eat. And when you say quality, they eat quality food because they eat organic food, right? They may not be as sophisticated as the cities, that's the other group. The cities are those who eat processed food. That's where the nutritional situation becomes a challenge. Now, those people, it's important we pay a lot of attention to them and improving the preparation of those foods for them. But um, to a large extent, Nigeria's basic problem today is the quantum of the food the quantum, we don't have enough. Why don't we have enough? The Nigerian farmers produce over 130% of the food Nigerians need to eat. But over 60% of that never gets to your table. It's wasted, either in the farm because there are no roads to take it to the market, or on the roads coming with all the checkpoints along the road, or in our own local markets, lack of preservation and so on. So in actual fact, the quantum of food we have is the first stage. Then you now look at the quality of the food. That is the situation. Yes, it's important we do that, but we have a problem, though, about the quality of food in Nigeria, but it's not as prominent as the quantum of food available. Yeah, when we talk about this quality of food, we now talk about affordability. Yes. Because for you to, you know, afford a quality <clears throat> food, I mean, it's pretty expensive yes. here. So... The challenge is simple. Like I said, you are producing a lot of food, 130% of the food we need to eat. Why is it so expensive? It's expensive because we threw away about 60% of it. But that person who bought the food from the village to bring to Lagos must recover his money. Therefore, you pay the high price. You pay for those that are in the dustbin as well as the one that you eat. Those are basically the situation. Therefore, Nigeria's strategy must now move away from this whole idea of let's get more food, produce more food, produce more food. Pay more attention to the preservation of the food God has given us. We have a large quantity of it. So the preservation, the pre-harvest losses are huge. Uh, humongous, one of the highest in the world. Now, let's deal with those. And this must start from the local government. Unfortunately, 
the whole idea of local government starts and ends in the Nigerian constitution. In reality, they don't exist. Because I ask so 10 did Nigerians. Did it, uh, starting from a local government and you're talking about yes. um, preservation, yes. how do they begin to preserve some of this food and then ensure that it gets to the end users? First, the mode of planting is important. But more importantly, mode of harvesting. Some people's harvesting system destroys the food. I give an example. You, you, you want to harvest oranges. You go on top of a tree, you shake it. They fall on the ground. The impact itself creates damage. Some of them get busted there. Some of them are injured inside. By the time they move to the market, they're supposed to go to, they're already gone rotting. Those are some of the things that, so the harvesting system is also important. And simple things through um, knowledge, through the our research institutions, can bring in simple things. Like I gave an example of oranges now. Mm. Put tapulin, ordinary tapulin under those, or under those trees. When they are shaking them, we don't have the machines to go and pluck them one by one like in developed countries. They fall on the tapulin, you will not have more, more than 5% of them going bad. Whereas the other system loses about 40% of them. So those kinds of things are where we need to link up those who are producing the food and those who have the research knowledge and spreading it up, we are building up a lot of young people who are looking for work. This is the kind of work they could be trained in. So the training of our people and our youths to be brought on board in this kind of situation. But the youths uh, really do not want to go to that, um, you know, towards that. Most youths don't want to go towards uh, agriculture, and that has been the, the issue there. Youth will want to go if you are able to present it in a manner that is positive. Like the, Dr. Adeshino said, he said, make agriculture sexy, the youths will go there. <laughs> and I would say between that time and now, a lot more youths have gone to the agricultural value chain. A lot more. I'm involved in the system and I see a lot of young people. Yes, the general mentality is that uh, agriculture is farming, which is not true. Mm. And farming is poverty, which is not true. I mean, you are a chartered accountant. Yes. And you, I mean, you had to bear into <laughs> agriculture. You must have seen something there. Oh, a lot. Yes, quite mm. a lot. A lot of huge, humongous opportunities. It's a place where you have an opportunity to create wealth for yourself, wealth for other people, and change the lives of people. First of all, understand it. Today's technology is not available to these people in the villages. So I have the privilege of being well-educated. So I can access this on the internet. There's so, so, so much information there. Our young people just go there and see the little, little things you need to do to make money from what has been produced. So the emphasis for me right now is not on the production, it's on saving and preserving what we have what produced we so they can get to your dining table. Sure. Now, the, the president, of course, uh, was at that summit and was one of the leaders that actually committed to uh, accelerating action, you know, to transform food systems. So what policy interventions do you hope to see uh, the government come up with in the short to medium term uh, at least, so that um, we'll probably match words with action? In the past, Nigeria, every, successive governors, governments have been coming up with words, words, words. And their body language has always been different. If the pres when the president comes back, let him match his action with his words, with his action. Because agriculture, the Minister of Agriculture today, what's the attitude to it? It's like any other ministry. You put a politician there. That is, we have not fully recognized the fact that our source of income called oil is drying up. The world is moving away from it. We cannot move away from feeding ourselves. Therefore, we must deal with that, and that's where we have the comparative advantage. A large portion of our land is available for development. A large portion of our food is available for further processing and semi-processing. These are the things that... So he must come back. For me, I don't see any reason why you won't have three ministers or four ministers dealing with agriculture specifically. And then Probably being looking given at the value chain. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. And then be given benchmarks. You must achieve this goal, must achieve this goal, that kind of thing. But what has always happened is just, it's just a statement. And everybody moves along. We come back again, we make the same statement. All right, here in Nigeria, we talk a lot about um, hunger, 
inflation, a lot of people can't even afford, you know, good food. So what is the place of um, genetically modified food, you know, in tackling the problem of hunger? Um, I will put it this way. I have no problem with GMO foods, as long as they've been proven not to harm the human body. I, in fact, encourage it because it's a modern way of increasing the quantum of food available to human beings. As of today, if you look at uh, the rate, uh, the yield of our produce, let's take maize, for example. Maize in Nigeria, because everything we've done is organic, we have not gone to the best practices. It's about four to five metric tons per hectare. Go to Kenya, it's 22 to 35, 000, 35 metric tons per hectare. Go to the United States, also almost 90 uh, metric tons per hectare. Because they have adopted the GMO, we need to eat before you start talking about the luxury of that. As long as the food is not harmful to you, I have no quarrel about GMO. When those countries have become so big and they have so much food, they cannot start discriminating between which is organic and which is not organic. A hungry man does not understand organic or inorganic. But then how do you identify, if you okay, talking about this um, uh, GMO food, yeah. how do you now uh, uh, you know, identify which of the GMO food probably is harmful or not harmful? Because even though you're hungry, I yeah. mean, you wouldn't want to die eating uh, something that is not um, good for your body. 99.9% .9 of the food we produce in Nigeria is organic. Because they are produced by these farmers who have no idea about these chemicals and so on and so forth. What they have but incidentally, done. what we have in the stores, mainly imported food, can't processed food, canned food. Mm -hmm. Yes. My dear, look, let's understand. We have two Nigerias. Lagos is not Nigeria, but it's not Nigeria. Port Harcourt is not Nigeria. The real Nigeria, where 70% of our people live in, are the villages. That's why I said at the beginning, these people eat good food. They may not be expensive, they, must be, they, must be, they may not be fancy. But so, to say we are worried and paying attention to the few people who live in the cities would be wrong. Let us improve what those people are able to produce now. Save those organic food they have produced and discourage the importation of these other ones coming into the country. Those are the big ones that, are, that we have problems with. That's where we have to recognize that Nigeria is blessed with a lot of land, uh, very fertile land. With the ones we are producing, let's make it available to the people. It will be cheaper and it will be, it will be um, more healthy. So what is the role of agribusiness in strengthening food systems in Nigeria? Every human being to a large extent is, an, um, is a capitalist. The, your grandmother in the village who has a mango tree in front of her house. She ensures that nobody comes to steal her mangoes. And on market days, they pluck and take to the market. She is a capitalist. Encourage that kind of thing. But when you now have a situation where government is in the front of the entire value chain, everything you want to do, the government is there, government has no idea about business. They have no idea about capitalism. Capitalism drives people to do the best they can. But when government is involved, they report to nobody, they are responsible to nobody. So what we need to do here, quite clearly, is that we've got to encourage people to see the profit that exists in it. And that's how young people will come into it. The average age of the farmer today is over 60. And they are getting old. We need so young people to start going should, into it. But they must see income. the advantage there that they have a future in it. That buttresses uh, what uh, the uh, AFDB president keeps, uh, you know, says yes. continuously, make agriculture a business. Absolutely. Perhaps when we do that, yes. the young ones will begin to look at it as Absolutely. a means of um, job creation, yes. employment. Thank for you. them. Thank you very much, Mr. Jewelry. Very grateful. Thank, Thank you. We do me. appreciate your time. Thank you. Yeah, Emmanuel Jewelry is the chairman, Best Foods um, Global. Okay, we take a break, and when we come back, Commodities Market Update is next. <laughs> we
We start off this segment on the global oil market as prices rose in early trade today, reversing earlier losses and extending their rally into a sixth session amid continued concerns over tight supply at a time when demand is picking up with the easing of COVID-19 pandemic. Brent crude futures gained 42 cents to $79.95 a barrel and actually hit $80 a barrel this morning, reaching its highest since October 2018. It surged 1.8% 1 on Monday. U.S. West Texas intermediate crude futures climbed 41 cents to $75.86 a barrel, hitting its highest since July. It jumped 2% the previous day, boosting investors' risk appetite. Goldman Sachs raised by $10 its year-end forecast for Brent crude to $90 per barrel. Global suppi supplies have tightened due to the fast recovery of fuel demand from the outbreak of the Delta variant of the coronavirus and Hurricane Ida's hit to U.S. production. And for more on the oil market and um, other issues on the commodities market, we have Dami Lola Akim, Bami, Head of Research at Financial Derivatives Company. Hi, Dami. Good morning, Chimese. Good morning. Good to see you. How Same are you doing? Day. I'm doing well. Well, we have seen improving global demand and, um, of course, um, the uh, supply tightening, mm -hmm. uh, particularly in the U.S., now um, pushing oil prices up. Of course, this morning we saw that hitting yes. $80. And that should Nigeria really uh, be excited considering our commitment to the OPEC quota? Yeah, so for Nigeria, it's almost like a double-edged sword. And by that, I mean that, okay, definitely would we stand to benefit from higher oil prices So because um, oil accounts for over 70 to 80% of our forex earnings and um, even fiscal revenue. But unfortunately for Nigeria, we are yet to um, ramp up our production levels. As at um, August, uh, Nigeria was producing about 1.2 million barrels per day, according to OPEC's monthly oil market report. So definitely, um, if you look at that, because for if you're considering oil revenue, you have to look at both the price and production aspect. So the higher oil prices right now might not necessarily fuel um, all the impact because so of the production So Nigeria is actually levels. struggling to even uh, reach the yes, OPEC, the reach OPEC the quarter OPEC, because yes. a report, a recent report has called out Nigeria and Angola struggling to boost output uh, to their OPEC quota levels and um, because of underinvestment yes. and of course Amongst nagging maintenance factors. You mm -hmm. know problems. Yes. Yeah, so even the federal government has um, the, the plan to actually ask for an increase in the in the country's um, production quota at the next OPEC meeting or OPEC plus meeting. Which would, but if we are not week, if we are not even mm -hmm. meeting up with the yes. cut, they I mean what they have given Nigeria mm -hmm. uh, already. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah, so I'm going to the government, we said that <laughs> addressing. So some of these challenges that are affecting um, Nigeria's oil production industry, oil production, basically, obviously, um, technical um, disruptions, pipeline vandalism, underinvestment. So according to the federal government, some of these technical issues are being resolved, and that's why they're asking for it. But before you could even ask for an increase, why don't you try and reach where you where you are supposed to be, first of all? So definitely a lot of things need to be put in place. And we know the Petroleum Industry Act has been, um, it's now a law, it's now an act, so definitely um, we expect that to have a positive impact on the industry. We know that there are still a lot of issues surrounding that act and uh, both legal issues and what have you. So th these things need to be addressed. I know I mentioned that it's a double-edged sword for Nigeria. So the, on the flip side, higher oil prices, because Nigeria imports all of its refined crude, so the more price, oil prices increase, the more the landing costs would increase. And right now, if you have oil prices trading at a above $80 per barrel, you can see the landing cost increased to, to almost 400 naira per litre. That means, and that's about 140% above the current retail price of Petrona, which is at 165 naira a litre. And if you look at what, what constitutes um, the landing cost, definitely all prices um, the exchange rate, and we know that the Naira 2 has been falling in the last couple of days. So for Nigeria, that, th this is very significant because even the NMPC recently released a report that the country has spent almost 1 trillion Naira on subsidy, subsidy. Um, petrol subsidies in the last eight months. That is significant. And the way it's going, it's quite inevitable. Yes. To, and I it, mean, taking it out yes. is quite inevitable. And the negotiation between the federal government and labor, well, is yet to bear any fruit, so we don't know where that is um, heading. So the more oil prices continue to increase, the weaker our currency gets, definitely it would impact negatively on um, the country in terms of higher force subsidies. And this even it's also important in the sense that 
while we're all talking about oil prices rallying and whatever you, the, the green revolution is picking up steam. We know that President Biden last month had said that he's targeting a 50% at um, electric vehicles. Most of the cars in the country will be at least 50% um, electric vehicles. We know that Ford, which is a US um, um, car manufacturer, has also announced about an $11 billion investment into the electric vehicle industry. We know that Europe too, they're also focusing on um, green um, revolution in China. So a lot of countries are shifting towards this um, um, electric cars and green revolution. Mm -hmm. Meanwhile, Nigeria is still talking focused, about talking about oil. oil. So investment is shifting away from oil into electric vehicles. So it gets to a point where the demand for oil would fall. But, and but it, some analysts will tell you that, um, well, we'll still have oil for a very long time. Yes, so for instance, now this in the short term, and by short term, I mean temporary um, period, so maybe next one to two years, definitely oil prices, especially if um, the market fundamentals are in favor of rising demand. So we may see oil prices continue to trade around $80, maybe even 90 before by the end of the year, especially even as you're moving to um, the, um, the winter season, so temperatures will fall, so you, there'll be increased demand for gas and what have you. Mm. But then in the medium to long term, the oil is going to get more obsolete and as the demand for oil falls, investments too will decline. We know that a lot of um, major international oil companies are already divesting the assets away from Nigeria. So as investments reduce in the global oil industry, supply too will be affected and that would also too, definitely oil prices, down there were seeing 80, 90 dollars per barrel, oil prices in the medium to long term might not be where they are and Nigeria, and Nigeria has to double down on the diversification efforts in terms of the revenue base and reduce its dependence on oil. Yeah. Now, talking about green revolution, of course, we saw a report by McKinsey yes. uh, yesterday uh, uh, saying that Africa needs about $2 trillion Dollars. for green manufacturing. Of course, that means mm -hmm. manufacturing, manufacturing companies moving away from fossil fuel. Yes. First, Africa does not even have mm -hmm. the funding. Mm -hmm. Yes, yeah, so it just further reemphasizes my point that the, the world is, is focusing more on the green revolution. The world is focusing more on electric vehicles. Even Niger, um, Africa, rather, as a continent that has this low um, green industrialization process and whatnot, Mackenzie conducted that report and said, oh, for them, for the African countries to switch from fossil fuel um, factories and industries to um, the green revolution, to having more electric vehicles and cleaner energy, they will need that amount of infrastructure. And because we are coming from a low base, it will be easier for us to switch to low-cost carbon um, em emission factories and what have you. So again, it just boils back to the point that Nigeria, the Nigerian government has to, th that thinking has to change mm. from oil, 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 because the world, the world is, is moving. moving. The world so is moving how, how do you it. link this, I mean, this report, you know, to what we're seeing now happening, particularly in Europe with the energy crisis and even in China? Yes. So what is happening in Europe right now, the energy crisis is a result of low inventory levels, again, because of um, what is the, sh the shift to electric vehicles. So Europe wants to be at the forefront of it all. And being the first person to achieve such a milestone, definitely you'll be the first to face the headwinds. So it's just like a warning signal to other countries like this is what is likely to happen and because of um, this crisis these low inventory levels and also Asia we are seeing an increase in their own demand and whatever so that's why we're seeing energy prices increase and even a lot of governments of European countries are already warning of a possible shutdown of factories and power outages power outage. yes occurring. we already experienced such <laughs> so I mean it's not going to be any news no, but, but, it, but it's, it's, it's important <laughs> why because one the, this green revolution because mm. gas prices are becoming more expensive yeah. a lot of governments may be forced to now start purchasing fossil fuel, which would undermine the Green Revolution strategy. Two, Europe is Nigeria's second largest trading partner by continent. So if, you are, if, you are, if, you, if factories start to shut down, output is affected, that is inflationary. We could see prices of commodities sold in Europe increase. And because it's a major trading partner of Nigeria, that could filter into what we import from this country. So it's a, it's a major issue. And um, if you even look at gas prices now, trading at over um, $5 per 
MMBTU. We can so see what's happening it, in the UK. In the UK mm -hmm. also. Yeah. Um, UK, in addition to rising gas prices, mm -hmm. they're also having shortage of truck drivers and, and whatever. So That's that, because of the that, Brexit that, issue. Exactly, because of that. the Brexit issue and that coming up with temporary visas for foreigners to come, mm -hmm. at least even if it's a three-month visa and whatever, to try and address that issue. So this, we're already seeing that it would spill over to, to various countries in the UK. I mean, the UK is experiencing it. European countries too are experiencing it. So it's a major issue. But for Nigeria, higher gas prices, we stand to benefit from that also because gas exports account mm. or gas ex accounts for about 12% of our exports. Yeah, so, so do, yeah. do you see this, I mean, the rise in the LNG mm -hmm. that we're seeing supporting our prices? Yes, yeah, so if, if gas prices are increasing in the international pro, um, market, it's, it would help to um, also boost our revenue from um, oil and gas. It would also help to boost our fiscal revenue and our external reserves. So we have oil prices increasing, we have gas prices increasing. So Nigeria stands to benefit from increased export earnings. But again, we also import. So that, that's, that's the unfortunate thing. As much as we export, we're also, we're also very import dependent. And we know mm. what's happening right now with liquefied petroleum gas, which is what we call cooking gas. The price yes. of a 12.5 kg cylinder is over 7,000 Naira now. So because gas prices are increasing, in the global market is filtering down because despite the fact that we produce the natural gas, but we also still import, import the yeah. LPG to meet um, local consumption. Right. Now, of course, talking about the outlook for the oil market, Goldman Sachs yes. is seeing about $90 and it, it could be possible. Could I mean, be, yeah. we're seeing $80 as it is Already. now, but for you, perhaps you're seeing $100, isn't it? <laughs> well, um, Right now, we could see oil prices trade towards 90, maybe even 100 before the year runs out. And with what is going on right now, because the market dynamics right now that's showing what, what we have in play right now is a supply deficit. So we have tight supply as a result of the impact of the hurricane Ida um, and, and um, even the um, tropical storm Nicola. So that shot in about 30 million barrels of US crude inventory. So supply is not rising as fast as um, demand, uh, the demand recovery, and because of the increased vaccination rates and more countries, more economies are reopening. We, the US recently opened its airspace to European airlines. So that increase in demand, it's far outweighs even OPEC plus a monthly increase of 400,000 barrels per day. So we expect that this would continue. The major threat right now is if another variant of the COVID virus occurs, which would now render the vaccine. We don't hope that that, that happens. <laughs> well, that, that's it. So that's the only major um, clause, if not, because again, we're entering into winter, the winter mm. season, and during winter, obviously, there's increased demand for gas, there's increased demand for crude, for heat, and so that definitely would also feed into higher um, oil and gas prices. All right, let's look at our uh, FX market. We have seen the Naira gradually moving uh, mm. from 410 um, and the NAFEX um, yes, the iron uh, segment, window, yes. uh, yeah, to about 415. Yes. Now, do you see this uh, as a gradual convergence, you know, between the parallel market and the official market? What we are seeing right now is what we call a crawling peg. So it's moving in a cobweb through a um, method or movement. So we like a cobweb, we know that um, the spider's cobweb, it keeps going in a concentric um, pattern until it gets to the middle. So for the Naira, for the Forex um, market in Nigeria, what we are seeing right now is that um, concentric movement. So we've been seeing the CBN gradually shift or move the I&E window in a crawling peg method from 410, 411, 412, now it's at 414, 415. Meanwhile, we've seen the power market appreciate a bit slowly so we're gradually going to see or get to a point where we would get come to a convergence so if the cbn increases its forex supply at the i and e window and the price continues to move then we might start to see um, that happen in the forex market all right thank you very much uh, damilola for your time this thank morning. you chimizi for having me appreciate it damilola came on is the head of research at financial derivatives uh, company we'll take a moment we'll be back Well, time for the morning calls to the market, and we have Anete there. Hey, Anete, well, we saw the bear resurface yesterday. That wasn't surprising anyway, considering what your analyst said yesterday. Yeah, that, that's right, Chimmy. But, uh, you know, the bear, it always has a way of, um, you know, coming uh, into the market just when you never expect. And, of course, what could be bad for some people means something good for uh, people on the other side. Of, uh, of, of the market. But before we go to the equities market, let's take a look at the fixed income market yesterday. 
was uh, most, mostly quiet trading uh, at the fixed income market, treasury bills market. It was just one deal, and that was on the 8th of September 2022 uh, paper. Of course, um, the, the, the average yield there remained unchanged at 5.6%. But this is what we had yesterday. Number of deals, just one, that uh, 80 billion uh, in value. Then, of course, flip over to the bonds market, uh, was, was also a bearish, was, uh, was rather a bullish um, uh, performance there. We had the highest deals there came from the 18th of March, 2036. And the total number of deals there, 21 at 22.41 billion. But when you move over to the open market operations, not much of activity there. Number of deals there was 10. And then, of course, total value there, 44.14 billion. So, but this week, we will be expecting the central bank uh, to, to roll over about 111.87 billion worth of maturities at the uh, Treasury bills market to market participants this week. So, and then, of, of course, the outcome is expected to shape the direction of uh, yields in the Treasury bills market. And then, of course, uh, some investors are, some traders are uh, expecting that um, lower yields. Um, will, of course, have an impact on uh, investors' sentiments in that market. So, but of course, we're supposed to have uh, 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 analysts there, Ramat Baba, you, you know, I don't know if, she, if she's on the line, so that maybe she can give us a, an, an analysis of that. But uh, in case, so let's just move over to the uh, other side of the market, the equities market, just like you rightly mentioned. We lost about... 51 billion naira in the start of the week. And of course, we are beginning to wind up the month of October, of September. Of course, the third quarter is also coming to an end. In a couple of days from now, we will be saying goodbye to the third quarter of, uh, of, of, um, of 2021. And of course, bye-bye to the month of September, which has not been too good for the market, especially in terms of performance. It's down 0.9% uh, month to date and then 3.5% down year to date. But this is what we had as at yesterday, 0.25% pullback from what we started the week, you know, uh, um, from the uptick that we had on, on Friday. Then, of course, banking sector, banking sector made some rebound, consumer goods as well, oil and gas. But then the pullback came from the industrial goods counter, especially because Boa Cement was in the red. And, of course, total volume of, of shares transaction there was down by 78 points. Uh, 78%. So now to give us more insight into the market, let's join Abdul Rashid Momo, who is a trader at TR TRW Stockbrokers. Thank you for joining us, Abdul Rashid. Yeah, thank you very much. So now the, the market, um, investor sentiment has been mo mostly lackluster. The month of uh, September has uh, been recording a, a lull in activity. So now can you tell us what is happening at the market? Why is the market just having this seesaw movement and not, not, not mostly a positive sentiment uh, from investors? No, if you, don't, if you, know, you, don't, you know, the market, we have so many, uh, how will I put it? Uh, there are so many equities that are traded. Um, Basically, what we need to know is that um, traders are actually concentrating more on the, um, I'll call them the penny stocks. If, I mean, they're, they're the ones that are actually moving the market now in terms of, um, um, you see the kind of returns they make. You see some making about um, 20, 30, up to 100% um, so far. Um, investors, um, they are more the other kind of investors. We call them the investors are more into um, the, the heavy stocks. Those are the blue chip stocks. And in, uh, in anticipation of further dividends to come, because if you compare those, what they pay now with what is in the money market, the stock market is still the place to be. Um, I always tell you that we always have two types of players in the market, the investors and the traders. So the traders are actually trading on the penny stocks. And those, that's why you see mostly you see your top gainers, at least the small cap stocks. So um, all in all, the market is, is still a bit um, shaky. Funds are not really in yet, but um, I know from next two months, we'll start seeing more inflows into the market in addition of the yeah, I mean the year, year end and the rest. Okay, so thank you for that uh, insight, um, um, Abdul Rashid. 
So that was Abdul Rashid uh, Momo, who's a, a trader at uh, TRW Stockbrokers. So, Chimmy, our advice to, uh, to intending investors is that you choose your stock wisely because, of course, it's not about how high value or low value it is. It's about what is return that, on investment it, is it, giving. Absolutely. It's actually those penny stocks that you can actually make um, mm -hmm. some quick profit there. And I guess that's what we're seeing in the market, just as uh, Abdul Rashid has said. Anyway, mm. thank you very much, uh, Anita. We take a break now. And when we come back, we cross over to London for the opening call. All right, let's uh, see what's happening out there in London. Now we have Juliana. Hey, Juliana, good morning. So what's the update on the fuel supply crisis? Yeah, Boris Johnson had put army on standby. Yeah, good morning, uh, Chimise. Well, long queues and fisty cuffs are still um, very visible um, on British roads at the moment. But I've got to say, it doesn't appear to be as bad as it was on the weekend. As you said, Prime Minister Boris Johnson has indeed gone ahead with the contingency plan. So the army are on standby. I believe there are about 75 army tankers armed and ready um, to get behind uh, the wheel of HGVs and drive um, petrol into um, the 8,000 strong um, petrol stations across um, the country. But it could be as much as 150. This has, of course, um, been welcomed in some quarters, but others think, you know, this just doesn't go uh, far enough, that it will help uh, perhaps for a couple of days. But what about the long-term plans? I think the government really are under increasing um, pressure, um, particularly when it comes to people who actually do need their cars to drive to work. Yes, we've got a pretty robust and uh, reliable transport system, but uh, now there are calls from emergency workers asking the government to try and put in place some designated um, uh, stations up and down the country that will be prioritised for key workers. And we're talking about people that need to drive um, bloods uh, from home to hospital, that need need to make sure that they are getting to um, uh, customers who are in need. That is um, the main uh, concern. Uh, but uh, it does appear as if the situation is beginning to ease. But of course, uh, demand still outweighs what it um, uh, did before BP released that statement on Thursday afternoon. Mm. And Bank of England's uh, chief says uh, UK interest rates rise in 2022. 22 is becoming more likely. Now, could this statement be linked to the current fuel price um, crisis? Well, I do think um, that, uh, of course, Andrew Bailey is watching um, uh, this uh, the crisis uh, roll out, and he is speaking uh, to Chancellor Rishi Shunak on a daily basis to see what exactly is happening uh, to the, the British economy. And in fact, his um, statements actually dragged down the FTSE 100 um, this morning. But really, I think uh, the central bank governor is doubling down on the statement that he made following the MPC meeting on Thursday, um, that interest rates will be rising. They are at the historic low of zero uh, percent at the moment. All of the nine MPC members voted unanimously to keep it that way. But inflation is uh, still peaking. And although we are starting to see consumer confidence obviously is much better than what it was this time last year. We are um, not sure how Q3 is exactly uh, going and people are starting um, to hold back a little bit. So the, the, the growth forecast for the year is still very uncertain. And until we can see that there is a strong, robust recovery, interest rates will still remain um, at this historic low to me. All right. Thank you very much, Juliana. We hope to get more updates from you later on Business Incorporated. Thank you. Okay, let's look at the crypto market segment there. Ladi, is the energy crisis dragging down that market? <laughs> well, it's uh, more regulatory issues in the crypto market right uh -huh. now. Uh, the crypto market is getting hit by uh, all uh, manners of regulation from the SEC, the US, and the China crackdown mm. still weighing hard on the market. It's red uh, this morning with Bitcoin and uh, major altcoins on the red. But we can see the stable coins are in the green because uh, traders are running into the stable coins to uh, escape the volatility right now. Uh, market cap, uh, $1.88 trillion is down by 4.39%. Uh, uh, volume is down by 15% this morning. And uh, Bitcoin dominance still at 42.53%. We've seen uh, Bitcoin 
you know, ranging between 41 and 45,000 uh, for one as stock at that range, but it failed to break at the 45K uh, uh, price. And uh, some traders say it might go below uh, 42,000 because it's looking quite weak right now. It's down about 3.32%. Anyway, let's uh, bring in uh, Rume Ofi now, Digital Market Analyst. Hello, Rume. Good morning. Good morning, laddie. <laughs> uh, countdown to the e naira the launch of the e naira uh we have a website uh, now that's still you know in uh, development how's the crypto community receiving this information well the, the, the crypto community is uh it's above the average uh individual in nigeria that is just getting involved in uh, digital assets uh uh like the ecosystem you understand because these guys involved in cryptocurrency they are quite um knowledgeable about how all of this is work. They understand what government is all about. You know, government is about control and seeing how far they could make all of their intentions uh, really straight. You know, uh, for, their, um, for their perspective, we, we actually spoke about oh, concerns about regulatory uh, and data privacy and education. You know, so it's Something that we need to, you know, in Nigeria we have uh, internet penetration is quite low, so I'm looking at the situation whereby how all of these things do work. You know, they said they're going to improve, but who is going to be involved in charge of data? Because someone is going to do transactions and somebody is going to be in charge of the office. Who's going to pass all of these? The highest you can know about Bitcoin, the time of transaction and the address transaction. You know, so uh, it's quite good. Uh, they will get better, but the thing is that. Those involved in the field are quite knowledgeable, and I don't think they want to patronize uh, a centralized system. Okay, so they'll prefer their uh, decentralized uh, option. Is that what you're saying? Exactly, exactly. <laughs> all right, so Ruben, we've seen uh, Bitcoin, you know, hit by all kinds of regulation these days. Uh, we've seen China crack down, and now the SEC chair, Gary uh, Gensler, is saying that um, crypto remaining unregulated is a problem. Is there a way to regulate crypto right now? Yes, uh, to some extent, crypto can be regulated. And uh, at some point, I was always thinking that this guy is just like forgetting the fact that he was really involved. He's one of the top guys that actually taught at some point at MIT about cryptography and uh, decentralized um, technology. So I don't know. There are some there, there are extent where you can uh, regulate this. For example, you can regulate uh, all centralized uh, exchange platforms, for example, like Binance and the like. You know, so what you can really regulate DEX. You can regulate DEX at all. DEX is the centralized exchange platform. You know, they are we're just getting involved in all of these, uh, getting involved in the internet, connecting to a protocol, for example, maybe the YBS or Uniswap. There are a lot of them, and even SRM, in the Solana ecosystem, just plugging into it, you cannot bring it down. It's like saying you want to drag the internet to a halt because of the fact that certain activities are going. It is not possible. So what they need to do is to, if you ask me, who does involve in the centralized uh, system, so that you don't, you don't give, you don't, if you stop these things, everybody goes to the centralized because that's exactly what happened when the ban, the, the ban started again in China. The, 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 this very one is quite really big. They are saying all transactions, all transactions going into exchanges from anywhere into China, foreign, that part, every uh, technological um, outfit that is doing transactions right. related to crypto should not be allowed. So now every, every one of these guys that are smart are going to them. And the, 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 the volume of transactions in, in the YDS, one of the decentralized exchange platforms, that the volume of is actually gone much high, even more than Coinbase. Okay. So, so you, are, you are pushing people. When you push them, also remember the fact that there are small people. They will go to another company that you cannot do that with. Right, so right. Always look at, yes, always look All at right, Rube. It could be flexible. Okay. All right, Rube, we'll keep watching, you know, how this space will get uh, regulated. But it will be good, you know, to protect, uh, you know, some of these traders from, you know, the bad guys out there in the crypto world. All right, Rume, thank you so much. All right, uh, Jimmy, it's uh, Ethereum.
below the $3,000 mark. Uh, it's all red across the uh, board with top of my cap. They all hit uh, down 4%, uh, percent, uh, Solana down 3%, XRP below $1 level. Uh, so it's, uh, it's uh, looking quite uh, bearish well, right yeah, now. I'm sure very soon we'll have the E-Naira. What would it be coin called? E-Coin, E-Naira? E uh, I guess e it would be... E Naira, then uh, you know I, I can't yeah. wait to download the very wallet. Very soon, though. of course, very soon we'll start uh, tracking, you exactly. know, we'll the trading the e -Naira, on, yeah. on that um, uh, platform. We'll see how that um, exactly. uh, goes. And talking about decentralized um, trading, I mean, this E Naira thing is still going to be pair to pair, even yeah. though it's going to be linked to a bank account, a bank perhaps account, your yes. bank account. That so way, they're still, you know, the central bank control uh, would of course bank. have uh, control exactly. uh, on it. We'll see how that goes. Yeah. It's a good thing. We'll start somewhere and we'll end somewhere. We'll download our wallets uh, come uh, October 1st. Well, now that the website <laughs> is up there, we'll see how, uh, see how it works. Exactly. All right. That's it on the program. Thank you for watching. Um, Chimizi Obiwa. And don't forget to join us uh, later in the afternoon by 1.30 on Business Incorporated for more updates on developments in the world of business. And I'm Ladi Williams. Thank you for watching.